now we're in business. All right. So protecting personnel. Uh, this is two sections here. I'll, I'll jam through this first section, and then we'll take a break and hit that second section. Um, OK, so personnel protection, lots of things that we have to talk about, including uh, monitoring, sh uh, shielding, uh, those type of, of things. So let's start with monitoring first. Personnel monitoring, or um, dosimetry, is a way of measuring the amount of uh, radiation that you're exposed to occupationally, that you're exposed to at work. You are required to have to be monitored, to have your radiation dose monitored, if it's likely that you will receive greater than one quarter of the occupational dose equivalent limit at any one time. So if it's possible for you to get an amount of radiation exposure at work, you gotta be monitored. And it's possible for you guys to get amounts of radiation exposure at work. Federal regulations require that uh, any monitor be worn on the portion of the body likely to receive the greatest radiation exposure. Ours are, we're told to wear ours at the collar level, and this is important, outside of any lead apron or shields. If you wear it inside of a lead apron or shield, it's not gonna be completely representative of your actual dose, right? Moreover, it's not gonna be representative of your exposure, right? You wearing a shield, whatever you're exposed to, you won't absorb all of it, right? Because you're wearing the shield. But we're not measuring your absorbed dose with these monitors. We're measuring your exposure, right? Exposure and absorbed dose are different things. You're exposed to an amount of radiation, but you don't absorb all of it, right? Even without a shield, you don't absorb all of it. Occupationally, we measure your exposure, not your absorbed dose, okay? Uh, so worn at the collar level, outside of any aprons or shields. This also lets us give, because it's worn so high, lets us give indications of uh, lens of the eye dose as well, because you can you know, extrapolate roughly how far the um, dosimetry badge is from the eye, the eye of an average person. So you can determine lens of the eye dose. Um, control monitors. Control monitors, uh, when you guys, so like when, when I get your dosimetry badges sent to me, uh, I get the box and in the box are all your badges with, a, with an inception date and an end date, like a start and end date. You guys know your badges expire, right? Um, and then in that box is a badge labeled control, okay? That control badge never leaves the box. That control badge stays in there and its job is to track and log the uh, background exposure, okay? Um, so you know that we're exposed to background radiation just by being alive here on Earth, right? And that badge absorbs that, and we subtract that from what your badges um, log. Because your badges are going to log the natural background too, because they're out here in the world too. So we subtract the control badge from yours, and that way we can figure out how much of your badge's exposure was from occupational uh, uh, exposure. Alex, you yeah. what, what about if that, um, that barrier that is between you and X-ray is that? Yeah. I have a picture of it on 813. Uh-huh. control remember. badge is in that window. Gotcha. In, in, like in your office, your control badge is in that yeah. window. It cannot be in the x-ray room. So make sure it's not a monitor badge, because we have monitor badges too. Does it say control on it? Uh, it could. Double check. I'll double check if it's, it's on that window. Yeah, so if it says control on it, it needs to be taken out of the x-ray room. Um, it needs to be kept in, uh, in, in like the manager's office, someone's locker, or something like that. But it's only made to track background dose, so it needs to be kept outside of the x-ray uh, suite. Um, now, there are, like here at the school, we're required to monitor radiation dose around the building um, because we have an x-ray room. We also have like adjacent rooms that for teaching, right? So uh, we have a badge, uh, usually I think we have two. We have a badges called monitor badges. So we have control badges and monitor badges. Instead of having a name, they say those two things. The monitor badge, that's kept in and around the x-ray room to just kind of sort of monitor dose on opposite sides of the walls and things like that. Um, the control badge always needs to be kept outside of the x-ray room, so it's only logging background radiation. So for example, here at the school, our control badge is kept in this front office in a, in a file cabinet where all the dosimetry badges sit until we, until we dispense them to you. So double check on that, that it's not a monitor badge. If it, if it is a control, it should be kept separate. Um, because if it's in the x-ray room, it's going to be logging occupational exposure, which is n nearly nothing, but still, yeah. And that window is a leaded glass window absorbing a significant amount of radiation, but something's getting through there, right? Um, yeah. So still gets through, right? Some. So you can, you can ne no matter, I mean, no matter how thick a shield is, right, 
it cannot possibly absorb 100% of the x-ray beam. It just can't. There's just no way. You can keep absorbing increasing amounts of it, but that number never gets to zero. Okay? Something is always getting through no matter how big the shield is. Right? Um, so it never goes to zero. Something's getting through the, the, the uh, control booth window. And we're going to talk about control booths in a little while. You'll see they're still safe, but um, yeah, there's a difference between something gets through and is still safe, right? It can be, something can get through and still have it be safe for you. Okay, good. Um, other things to think about for uh, personnel monitoring, unprotected heads and necks, including the lens of the eye, receive about 10 times the torso dose when the torso is covered with a lead apron. So we should probably put lead shields on our heads, right? <laughs> No, right? That makes um, problems, yeah? So uh, for one, our cranium with our brain in there, really not a radiosensitive organ. Our lens of our eye is, and our lens of our eyes are, and our thyroid is, okay? So for those reasons, if we're around the beam for long periods of time, um, around radiation for long periods of time, uh, we will usually wear thyroid shields, and leaded glasses. They look like regular glasses, but they're a lot heavier, thicker lenses, and the glasses are impregnated with lead, and that lead blocks the beam. So there's ways to get around this, right? But yeah, if you have a, a, a covered uh, torso, lens of the eye and face are getting about 10 times more. A small reminder for people that have been with me for a while and went through chapter 40 in the textbook, we talked about dose, uh, personal personnel monitoring badge types. Those are OSL, TLD, film badge, and pocket dosimeters. Uh, these just refer to the way the badges store the radiation uh, that they've been exposed to and how that radiation is then released at the company later on so that they can track how much you received. It's kind of like some a toy that glows in the dark, right? You know there's toys that glow in the dark, you hold them up to light, turn the lights off in the room, and they fluoresce, they light up, right? These badges are sort of like that, except for that they um, they get exposed to radiation, so get exposed to light, right? But they don't immediately re-emit it like a like a glow-in-the-dark toy does. They have to be stimulated to re-emit what they absorbed, and that happens back at the badge company. But anyways, optically stimulated luminescence detectors, OSL, thermoluminescing detectors, TLD, film badges use a piece of photographic film. Pocket dosimeters are for uh, radiation physicists, nuclear technicians, people like that. Okay, more important than the actual badges themselves right now is uh, the reporting, okay? Personnel monitoring reports, um, these cover a period of time. They should include proper identification of the employee, current period dose, so for this period of time, usually like three months, quarter, what's their dose? Um, things like cumulative annual dose, Cumulative total exposure, so for the entire time you've had your badge with this company, we're going to track your total exposure. And then things like the unused portion of the cumulative lifetime dose equivalent limit. You may know that you have a maximum uh, lifetime limit to the radiation you can receive, okay? And um, if you exceed that, we want to stop you from getting increases in exposure, right? So good reports may have... Um, Here's what you've gotten for your lifetime. Here's how much you have left, how, how much you're allowed up to this point for your lifetime. A couple notes on the chart, the, the, the report that I'm going to show you on the next slide. An M listed in any section means minimal. N means negligible. Both of those things basically mean it was not measurable. Okay. So no reportable dose for you if it comes as an M or an N for minimal or negligible. Let's take a look. So, the names over here? No, they just took the names off. Okay. All right, so each one of these lines would be a employee. Okay, <coughs> on this one it looks like the names are all off and what you have are some employee identification number. Uh, name would go here, name or birth date would go here, obviously there's a column for sex, dosimeter, um, and then so this one would be the control dosimeter, this next one down is a whole body dosimeter, the, one, the ones that you guys wear. So looking at this one, second line down, the white line, 
This first column, uh, this first column here, shows the dose equivalent for the period shown below. That period is from 10-15-09 to 1-14-2010. Um, and for the second person down, we have the deep dose, the lens of the eye dose, and the shallow dose. Don't worry too much about what each one of these different ones means, but these are just, diff just different ways of uh, expressing the, the dose to the patient. We wear the badge on our collar, right? And once, they, once the badge company takes that badge and processes it, they can infer from that how much dose you got deep within your body, how much dose the lens of your eye got, and how much dose your, basically your skin got. From all from what that badge absorbed. And notice this person, the second one down, the control badge received minimal, minimal, and the second person down that we were looking at received minimal for deep dose, minimal for eye dose, and minimal for shallow dose, nothing even reportable during, during this period of time. Same thing for the, for the quarter of the years is quarter four, that, that period, same thing, should show minimal there. Moving over, Whoa. it's going to go up a lot here, but we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, year to date, again, we're on the second line down, the year to date, so for the year of 2009, which I think we, we, we started at the beginning of the year, right? We went from, yeah, we went from this, uh, October to 2009 to 2010. But anyways, this is the quarter four, this is quarter four, of basically, of 2009 and so for the entire 2009 year we can document your dose for the whole year so we show you each quarter on each report and then each report is going to show you up to that point for that year what's your total dose okay deep lens of the eye and shallow second line down minimal 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 okay but if you look down this employee got nothing for the quarter but for their year to date we're not going to go over here yet but for their year to date we have 29, 31, and 32 for deep lens of the eye and shallow. This unit is in millirem, okay? It's a, a unit of radiation. You can convert millirem. Let me give it to you really quick. Because what's our, what's our, what are our units for occupational exposure? The unit of radiation used for occupational exposure, typically. The gray is for patients. Sievert, right? I'm always going to get it wrong if the eye goes first. But anyways, Sievert is our unit for um, occupational exposure. Occupational exposure. Okay. For x-rays, one gray equals one Sievert. But we like the unit Sievert for occupational exposure for reasons I won't get into right now. Now, one Sievert to the whole body, if it's x-rays, can cause death. That's a lot of radiation, right? So for our purposes, we usually like either millisievert, which is one, oops, one one thousandth, that was terrible, sorry, one one thousandth of a sievert, okay, one one thousandth sievert, or we like micro sievert, which is one one millionth of a sievert. Okay. To go from millirem to to micro, let's say a little u, to micro sievert. Let me get this smaller. So to go from millirem, which is what this chart expresses these units in, to micro sievert, we're going to take the number in millirem. Millirem times 10 equals that, come on, equals micro sieverts, okay? So just multiply this number by 10, and that'll tell you what it is in micro sieverts. So the shallow dose for this patient was 320 micro sieverts, instead of 32 millirem. This unit, millirem, the rem, is a standard or British unit of radiation measurement, where the sievert is the metric system. Okay. Just different systems of measure. Don't worry too much about it. You guys need to remember the metric system, the, the SI units, right? Sievert, gray, things like that. But unfortunately, companies are still behind, and, and, and uh, recommendations for radiation measurements, uh, science and medicine has turned over to the metric system, but for whatever reason, measuring radiation, in a lot of cases, is still using the old units. So we use millirem instead of micro sieverts. 
something you have to deal with. You'll need to be able to know the conversion. That's our conversion. Anyways, all these techs, almost nothing. I mean, this person got one milliram or 10 microsievert over that period, a teeny tiny amount of exposure. But this person got quite a lot. This person less. This person got nothing more. That person got a lot more. Why? So we don't know. Uh, there's no names and no, no explanation of where these, which part of the facility these people work in. You know, maybe these are techs not working in, you know, in, um, in fluoroscopy, not working in uh, interventional radiography, right? Or maybe these techs are just doing a much better job of shielding themselves, okay? These, by the way, are very low doses, but they're, um, they're you know, they're, there's nothing, and then there's something, right? So some people get nothing, some people get something, and uh, you want to you track it, right? Now, there's, there's errors, too. You know, people make mistakes. They leave their badges in the x-ray room. Um, they leave them in their car, things like that. The newer badges uh, nowadays are not super susceptible to being left in the car and being exposed to UV, but it still, can, it still can add exposure, potentially. So that's why we tell you to keep them out of your car, take them in and out of your house, don't leave them in your office. Okay, so yeah, some people have minimal or negligible and then some people have something measurable. The important thing is, is that we have it tracked now, right? And forever, as long as we keep this record, we'll now know how much each employee has received. And now we'll go to this last part here. Uh, the lifetime of this person. Now this is not actually the person's lifetime dose. This is the person's lifetime dose since they've been with this company. And if they worked for a company before this, and brought over their old records, those records have been added to this. But if they didn't bring in over their old records, whatever monitoring company was taking care of them before, you know, we didn't transfer records over, then, then their lifetime dose is only what they've gotten while they've been with this company, okay? So that's why it's important, like when you leave school, you know, by the way, all your badge reports come back with, with M minimal or N negligible. No one gets any exposure because you guys are all behind the control panels. But, um, you know, you don't know that unless you look at it, right? And I, you can trust me, but, you know, you want to maybe look at it, yeah? Um, so my advice for you is when you graduate, ask for your dosimetry report from us, okay? It's going to come with everyone else's, so we'll block everyone else's name out, but ask for your report. That way we can print it off and show you, here's what you got while you were a student, right? Which is usually almost always nothing. Um, and that way you can add that to, you, you know, where you, when you go to work for this company. So let's take a look. This person here, remember these, this report was from 2009, right? So the inception date for this second person was January of 1979. They've been working with this same company and had these numbers reported since 1979. So while this person, you know, for their shallow dose only had one uh, millirem, <coughs> their shallow lifetime dose is 1,674 millirem, okay? Because they've been doing this since January of 79. Okay. How about the 1993 one? 1993. Yeah, so you know, this person's been working for, you know, less, was that 14 years difference, right? 14 years less, is that right? Yeah. It says record of years, five years. Five years record. So, what's the description? Oh, records for a year? Records for a year. I'm going to have to go remind myself what that's supposed to mean, but that's not. That's not how many years it's been recorded. Records for a year. I know the inception date is when the batch had, when we started monitoring you. Right. So I'm gonna have to remind myself what that is. I can go, I we use a similar batch company, so I'm gonna have to go remind myself what that actually is. I'll go check on that. Good point. But um, yeah, so let's say this person was monitored since 93, this person was monitored since 79. This person's got basically twice the dose, right? They're doing something different. Either they're doing a different kind of job, or what they're doing, they're doing it in a less safe way, okay, than the other person. More than likely, they're doing a different type of job. Maybe one of them's working in, in you know, in fluoroscopy more often or surgical. The other's doing just, you know, diagnostic x-ray inside the x-ray suite. But the point is, is that we have these reports. We are monitored regularly. You are entitled to your reports, and so your... Um, company that you work for should make the report available to you, easily accessible to you, every time they come in. And they usually come in every quarter. So every three months you get a report. 
And so what I like to do um, is to just post it in, in like the, on my memo board and let the x-ray techs have a chance to look at it, and then I file it away. Okay. Uh, but someone's got to look at it, someone's got to make sure we understand what the numbers are, and then offer the employees a chance to look it over. If there's any numbers that look weird and ab none of these, by the way, look weird and abnormal to me, these are all pretty normal. Uh, but if anything looked abnormal, I would bring it up to the radiation safety officer, let them discuss it with the employee and make a plan. You've got to make a plan for, you know, why is this happening? How can we prevent it from happening in the future? But, but there you go, that is our, um, those are our badge reports. Okay, let's move forward. Okay, back to this, the cardinal rules of radiation safety, the cardinal principles of safety. <clears throat> so things you need to know. When we, um, when we get into the x-ray room, we turn on the x-ray machine, and then we make an exposure, okay? Um, we're only creating x-rays as long as that exposure has been set for. So if you set the exposure for a tenth of a second, x-rays are only being produced for a tenth of a second, okay? It's not like after you turn the machine off, x-rays are going to continue to bounce around the room, okay? They travel at the speed of light because they are light, and once they scatter like twice, they've already lost almost all of their energy, they're gone, okay? Exposure of a tenth of a second means the room is uh, having active radiation for a tenth of a second, and any whatever your exposure time is, that's the case. During that exposure time, the patient is the main thing that exposes the radiographer to radiation. Think about it like this, right? X-rays travel in straight lines, right? So, and the X-ray tube is pointed at the patient. So none of the X-ray tube's primary radiation, as long as you're not you know, looking right up at it, none of the X-ray tube's primary radiation can reach the radiographer because X-rays travel in straight lines. They don't, they're not gonna you know, take a bending path out of the X-ray tube towards you. So the only radiation that you can be exposed to as the radiographer is scatter from the patient because it's the only kind of radiation you're exposed to as long as your body parts aren't within the primary beam, which is possible. But as long as you're not doing that, scatter is what you're at risk for exposure to and scatter is the most harmful kind of radiation um, for you, okay? Because it's already interacted with the patient, it's lost energy and will have a lower likelihood of passing through your body. Said in another way, it has a greater likelihood of staying in your body, right? Radiation staying in the body is worse than radiation passing through the body. Okay, with that said, the three things you wanna make sure you're doing is minimizing your time around the patient during the exposure. Time and exposure are direct and proportional. Uh, exposure, if your time around radiation goes up, your exposure to radiation goes up. That's the direct part of it. The proportional part is, if you double your time around radiation, you have doubled your exposure to radiation. How right? did you double your time of radiation? Just, just talking about in principle, like just even just think about like hanging out in the sun, right? You hang out in the sun for an hour, you got an hour of sun exposure, right? Hang out in the sun for two hours, you've got, well, twice as much sun exposure, right? Same thing is true for radiation, right? The more time you spend around it, the more exposure you get to it. So time is direct and proportional with exposure. Um, you know, and it's just purely hypothetical right now. Um, because you're not spending really any time around, you're not actually spending any time around your patients, right? Because you're standing in the control booth when you make your exposures. This is why we stand in a control booth when we make our exposures, because things like time are, are uh, and exposure are direct, related directly and proportionally. Distance from a source of radiation is related uh, inversely and um, exponentially. So the, the way to think about it is, as you increase your distance from the source of radiation, you decrease your exposure to it, right? You back away from a source of radiation, your exposure to it goes down, okay? It doesn't go down proportionally. Twice the distance does not mean your dose goes down by half. Your dose goes down by about, you know, uh, uh, four times, okay? Not even about, it goes down exactly four times if you exactly double your distance. That's that inverse square law that we've talked a lot about. Lastly, shielding. Shielding uh, is inverse and exponential to exposure. Increasing your shielding decreases exposure by a lot. You double your shielding, 
your exposure doesn't just get cut in half, it gets cut by a lot more than a half. That's the exponential part of it. So minimize your time around radiation, maximize your distance from radiation, and maximize your shielding. Um, your patient is the thing that's scattering radiation. So your patient's the thing we're trying to minimize the time around, maximize the distance from, and maximize the shielding from, okay? Let's look at uh, a statement from the NCRP. In their report titled Report Number 116, they say things like, whenever possible, all personnel should stand at least two meters from the x-ray tube and the patient. This is huh? about six feet, six feet, six inches roughly. This is why we say stand six feet from the patient or be at least six feet away. If you have to be in the room, somebody has to be in the room, be at least six feet away. Or we'll say things like at six feet, you're safe, stuff like that, right? This is where that comes from. Okay, uh, because exposure at about six feet away is, is, is significant. So let's look, significantly less, let's, let's look at this. So we know things like scatter exposure at one meter from the patient is one one thousandth of the patient's in beam exposure. So the exposure they're getting at one meter from the patient were one one thousandth of that, okay? At two meters from the patient, doubling your distance, that's gonna decrease by a factor of four. So it's not just gonna get cut in half, it's gonna get cut by a lot more than a half, okay? So for those reasons, that six foot distance, uh, two meter distance is what we'll, what we'll like to say is, is, the, is the right amount of uh, distance to stand away. Looking at another report uh, from the NCRP, this is report number, I'm, I'm skipping just a little bit, so if you're following me on the lecture notes, I'm moving around. But anyways, uh, NCRP report number 102 says things like, only persons whose presence is necessary shall be in the diagnostic x-ray room during exposure. Who's necessary? Like a parent or the patient? Say it again, Joe? The radiographer and the patient. And but um, the radiographer is not going to be in the like in the in the like room. They're in the control booth, yeah. right? So who's necessary? Patient. A patient, right? The patient is necessary. That's the only person who's absolutely necessary to start with, okay? Because we have to have somebody we're X-raying, right? Who else might be necessary in that exposure area, Debbie? Yeah, you might have a parent or guardian necessary, right? You might have some other staff who's necessary to you know, help keep the patient still, right? Uh, provide immobilization. By the way, whenever possible, patient immobilization should be done um, with um, uh, inanimate objects, right? Uh, sandbags, tape's less ideal, but sandbags, tape, foam support pads, things like that, okay? If you can't use some inanimate object to do the supporting of the patient, you should use a non-radiographic uh, uh, staff member or a patient guardian or parent. Sometimes you don't have all those things, but uh, the point is, is that we try to limit the amount of people. This is what reason, one of the reasons why. Okay, so anyways, people who are necessary can be in the x-ray room. Everyone else should be out of the x-ray room. So I get a, you know, I'm, I'm interning at my hospital that is near a, uh, a prison, right? I get my prisoner coming in, okay? Perfect. Who do they come with? The guards, right? A couple guards usually, right? Guess who gets kicked out of the room during the exposure times, right? The guards do, okay? Because their presence is not necessary in the x-ray room as long as the patient's cooperative. And again, as I told, told you guys before, the patient will be cooperative, I promise you. Um, so yeah, we take them out of the x-ray room, okay? We say, hey, you know, we need you to leave, and they say, oh, no problem, right? They go stand outside of the x-ray room. Um, so there's lots of examples like that where, you know, maybe uh, maybe it's like an adult and they just want to have like their spouse with them or something. We want to keep them out of the room. Yeah, I yeah. had an 89-year-old, she had a dementia. Yeah. And her daughter was with her. Yeah. And we, it was me and Josh. Yeah. We but, were uh, trying to position her, but she just kept moving around. So that's a good example, right? You kind of treat them like a child in that yeah. case, right? They have somebody who's acting as their guardian, right? They might not be like somebody who has power of attorney or whatever, but they're acting as their guardian, right? And it's pretty clear that we need that person with them to do things like get an accurate history, do accurate positioning, things like that. So, so you brought you brought the daughter with her. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I put the, uh, show how old was daughter? If she, the lady's eighty nine. Daughter could have been outside of reproductive range. Was it like forties? Oh, okay, gotcha. So, um, what are you going to ask the daughter before you bring her in? 
What, what did you, let's say, what did you ask her first? Right. Even though she's not the patient, we want to make sure if she's going to be in the room, is there any chance that she could be pregnant, right? So she said no. Yes. Right. Did you do anything for her when you brought her into the room? The, 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 the guardian, the daughter. Did she wear a shield? I just put the, the shield, just like wrap it around the... Yeah. So do you have um, over-the-shoulder shields? The big aprons, the full aprons? I think, I'm not too sure, but... Check if you do. You'll want to use those for your patients. Uh, sorry, for your um, guardians, sorry. people that have to stay in the room. Um, yeah. So that's the deal, right? Um, so you did the right things, right? Anyone who, ha who must be in the x-ray room during an exposure, like that guardian, all such persons shall be protected with lead aprons. Okay, we'll talk about lead apron thickness requirements in a little bit, and it's all super technical stuff, but you have to remember these numbers, unfortunately. We asked, we asked them sometimes as a guardian, and they laugh. Like, you know, are you pregnant? They're like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like if they're way outside of the yeah, reproductive yeah, like, range, yeah. Well, just, you, gotta ask. you gotta ask. So just get ready. Just get used to those, you know, f -f 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 answers, you know, and whatever. Um, and remember, eight to eighty, right? Ask them. Don't 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 feel weird about asking them. Um, I'd rather you do than not. I mean, you don't want to accidentally miss the sixty-year-old who's pregnant, right? Because for one, if she's sixty and pregnant, it's already sort of a high-risk pregnancy, right? And um, so you don't want to make any any other complications. So yeah, don't don't be afraid to ask. The, the worst thing that can happen is um, that they're could be pregnant, <laughs> be pregnant, right? And in which case, you did the right thing. Yeah, right, 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 you know, good for you. <laughs> okay, so this is where that comes from. This is why we don't allow just anybody in the x-ray room. So yeah, if you had like a, a patient and a spouse, and the spouse didn't need to be there, but wanted to be there for like emotional support. Emotional support's not a good reason to have someone else in the x-ray room. So we explain, you know, we're just gonna put you outside the door. Sometimes I will bring like a parent uh, back to the x-ray room, but then actually kick them out of the room during the exposure, right? So it's just like, here, you can be with your kid while I'm doing all this stuff, positioning, and like, as I walk away to go press the exposure button, I kick them out into the hallway, close the door, make the exposure, and bring them back in. It's one way to do it. It's like less ideal. Uh, plus, where my x-ray room is, is like where all the doctors and MAs are, so it's kind of a weird thing. Um, but it happens. So just, you know, just try to do your best to keep anybody who doesn't need to be in the x-ray room out of the room during exposure. If they need to be in there, parent, guardian, something like that, they need to wear a lead apron. The right kind of lead aprons are the over-the-shoulder kind, the kind that protect the chest and, and below the waist. Uh, regulations also state that uh, during lengthy fluoroscopic procedures, the lead apron shall always be worn. This, uh, they make sure to say shall always be worn because I don't know if you put lead aprons on, they're very heavy and fluoroscopic procedures can take a long time. And uh, so, so some people like to take them off because they're heavy and uncomfortable. You gotta wear them <laughs> during the fluoroscopic procedures. Yeah, there was some guy who came in with a, a dislocation. So uh, we made him like lay down on his stomach and like have his arm like hanging. Mm -hmm. And we like attach the, the lead. Um, to, to, as, as a weight, full traction, weight. yeah. They, they manipulate up on his scapula, they tweak yeah. up his scapula, yeah. That's, a, that's the best way that I've seen to reduce a, a dislocated shoulder, having them lay on their stomach, right? And then let their arm hang off the table. The doctor rotates the scapula up and forward, right? And then pull traction on the arm, and yeah. it just pops it right back in. I was helping the doctor and I heard the pop, I was like, oh. Yeah, it's great, it's one of my favorite <laughs> things to, to assist with is putting, putting shoulders back in. I did one one time um, where the, patient young girl had fallen at the beach into sand and sand can be pr pretty hard you know, especially that like compact sand and he she 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 dislocated and this is like a 10 year old girl doctor i was pulling traction on her pulling down on the arm and the doctor's manipulating her scapula and she's just you know of course it's screaming in pain right and but like way worse than you would have thought right the doctor like wrenched on her for probably a lot longer than i, I would i would have but um after a while it just wasn't going back in go to the x-ray room and take the x-ray, which should have been done first, right? Humeral head fracture. So we're tweaking on her humerus while she's got a humeral head fracture. Right, so she needed to go to the ER, be sedated, and then have it reduced. But um, yeah, those are, those are fun, right? Oh, that's great, that's great. They're all loosey-goosey, right? Um, that's fantastic, yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, there you go. So lengthy fluoroscopic procedures, we gotta wear our lead aprons. Uh, leaded aprons shall always be worn during those procedures. Um, to, and also to be clear, uh, so we don't do fluoroscopy as a limited x-ray tech. 
We also don't do mobile radiography. Mobile radiography, if you haven't heard of it before, there are machines that can uh, be, they're an x-ray machine, but they can roll around a facility, a little, little cart, like the, they're about as big as the ultrasound machines are, and um, they can take x-rays just like the x-ray machines can, but we do them outside of an x-ray room, mobile. Um, because we're outside of the x-ray room, there's no structural shielding, anything like that. So we've got to consider people around us, those kind of things. We also, because there's no structural shielding or control booth, have to be wearing, uh, the operators have to be wearing lead aprons. Operators of mobile equipment should wear lead aprons. Notice how they don't say shall or must. They say you should, okay? What would be an alternative if you're a mobile machine operator to wearing a lead apron? Le that's shielding. Um, yeah, but there's, there's no room anymore. So like uh, think about like an ER, right? Um, emergency room where there's like no real room. Yeah. The radiographer or the nurses and doctors? With their button? Yeah. So by the way, the, there's no point for them to step out of the room because the room doesn't actually stop anything. It's the distance, right? So the, the, the shields are shielding, right? And what are our three cardinal rules of radiation safety? Time, distance, shielding. Can you do anything about the time? No, you shorten your exposure times, but you still have to be set a time, right? If you're not using your shield, right, your, your, your lead apron, then what's the other thing that you can do? Distance. Maximize distance, right? Which is why they're, they're stepping outside of, the, outside of the rooms, moving as far away as possible, right? So the room doesn't actually do anything for them. Um, the distance does it, okay? The inverse square law tells us as f the farther we get away, the lower our exposures are. Operators of mobile equipment should wear lead aprons. The should is because we can do things instead of wearing the lead apron like maximizing distance. Apron and gloves should be worn when holding a patient or when closer than two meters to the beam. So if you're for any reason being required to be in the room during an exposure, which we try not to do unless it's an emergency, um, we should be wearing the lead apron anytime we're two meters or less from the beam. Apron and gloves if we have to hold our patient still. Now, for holding patients still, patient immobilization, uh, again, inanimate, inanimate objects are best, okay? The second option is patient uh, guardian or parent, something like that. The third option is a non-radiographic staff member, a nurse, a doctor, reception staff, administrator, something like that, right? Just somebody who doesn't work in the x-ray room. The last option for pa holding patients are the x-ray techs, okay? It seems, that seems backwards, right? But the reason why is because we spend all of our time in and around the x-ray room, so we want to minimize the amount of times we're actually in the room at the spot where the x-ray beam is being uh, produced. So anyways, that's NCR, that is something from NCRP report 102. I have both of these reports here at the school. Like I don't have copies like hand out, but I've got a copy of each in, in my little library area. And if you like to check it out, you're welcome to. Um, but these are big, these are, you know, big hundred page ish reports and, um, lots of important information in them, but I've covered two important things so far from those two reports. Let's look at the uh, actual thickness requirements because we got to work on remembering these. Um, lead aprons should be, must be worn by anyone whose exposure may exceed 50 microgray per hour. Um, that's the number to remember. Uh, that's easy to get up, that's easy to exceed. Get out of here. Okay. Here's what you need to remember the lead thickness requirements, okay? Um, a lead thickness of 0.5 millimeters is required if machines are routinely operated above 100 kVp. Do our x-ray machines routinely operate above 100 kVp? What's the most common X-ray procedure, chest X-ray, and what kind of KV levels do you set for chest X-rays? Hundreds and above, right? So, because it's a regular routine thing that we do, our machines are routinely operated above that energy level, and our lead aprons are a uh, half of a millimeter thick because of that. Um, yearly, your aprons should be checked. Now, aprons can actually be made of lead, and I don't know if you've ever like held lead in your hand, it's heavy, but, it, it, it's, it, but it's very malleable and soft, okay? You can bend lead very easily. If you take a sheet of lead and bend it, you can bend it very easily. But as you bend it, you'll notice that you'll develop cracks in it pretty quickly, okay? And you do that a bunch of times and the lead, apron, the lead is gonna develop a nice crack down the middle, a nice opening where it wouldn't stop anything, right? 
The aprons that we use do not have to be made of lead, but some are. And even if they're not made of lead, the material can still crack, right? Where, where like anything folds, it can develop a crack. Um, it's smart to um, image your aprons once yearly to check them for cracks, okay? Now, if your facility has a fluoroscopy machine, a video x-ray machine, you can basically lay your apron out on the table and then run the machine over the whole apron. It takes just a, a, you know, a few seconds to image the whole apron. If you don't have fluoroscopy, you need to take plain film x-rays of your aprons. Uh, you need to lay them down and basically shoot them in quadrants and look, <laughs> look for cracks. The apron is lead. It should stop the x-rays. The part of the... Part of the uh, image where the apron is should be roughly whitish okay a crack will show up as a dark 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 line a dark black line on the on the image so it's worthwhile to check our our uh, aprons once yearly to look for cracks if they are cracked they should be discarded and new ones should be um, purchased leaded gloves leaded gloves are required to be a 0.25 millimeters of lead or lead equivalent um, that's because a half millimeter would be very hard to move around. Well, I think we have half millimeter gloves here. Uh, next time you're in the X-ray room, you can put them on. They're, they're like you know space band gloves. They're, they're, you can't really manipulate much. You can basically like maybe if you had to hold on to like a cup or something, uh, which is what the X-ray tech would have to do to like give your patient barium to drink. You have to be able to hold a cup, but you can't do much else. You can't type on a computer or operate the equipment with these gloves on. They're just they're just too bulky. So how effective is this, okay? Um, I said things earlier like there's no way to stop 100% of the X-ray beam. Um, we can stop a majority of it and even upwards of 99% of it, but you cannot stop the whole thing. So on average, lead aprons, regardless of thickness, are about 85% effective. Basically they absorb everything up to about 85% and about 15% of the beam passes through them. They range from being about 66% effective to 99% effective. So the, the thickest lead aprons will absorb 100, almost 100%, 99% or more. And the, the weakest lead aprons, the thinnest ones, absorb about 66%, two-thirds of the beam. Example given, a half millimeter of lead, uh, the, the symbol for lead is PB, capital P, little b. A half a millimeter of lead is 88% effective. It absorbs 88% of the beam when the beam has an energy of about 75 kVp, okay? If you increased the kVp, would the effectiveness go up or down? Down, down right? If you increase the energy of the X-ray beam, more of it's gonna get through the apron, right? So if you went up to a, uh, uh, sorry, if you went up to 100 kVp, that number goes down somewhere into the 70s or so. You can check the notes that I've given you, but, um, Actually, let's check it. I'll just gotta remind myself. A half mil yeah, seventy-five. A half millimeter of lead at hundred kVp absorbs seventy-five percent of the X-ray beam. I gave you guys a while back a, a, a three or four-page document called Physics and Safety Study Points. Um, you guys probably don't have this, but that's okay. You'll, you'll get it. It's not going to be super important for this section. Um, but anyways, it has on there these attenuation properties. And um, yeah, so the NCRP says that at 75 kVp, a half millimeter apron absorbs 88%. But bump up the energy to 100 kVp, and that same apron only absorbs 75%. So 13% more gets through, right? Um, the point is, is that... The thicker the apron is, the more it absorbs, but then conversely, the higher the energy of the x-ray beam is, the less the lead can absorb, right? more gets through. So there's a, there's a battle, right? Thick aprons absorb more, but high energy beams let more through. And our aprons are typically a half millimeter thick. This uh, graph that I'm gonna show you here is showing the uh, effect of stacking lead aprons or stacking like sheets of lead. Um, they don't tell us, I'm assuming they're uh, you know, roughly a half millimeter lead, but anyways, take a sheet of lead, a half millimeter sheet of lead, you know, 75 kVp x-ray beam, one apron absorbs 85%, so the beam goes to down to 15% passes through two aprons 
goes from 15% passing through to now only 2% passing through. So you double the thickness, right? So you go from a half millimeter, which absorbs 85% of the beam, to one full millimeter by stacking two half millimeter aprons, and now you're absorbing 98% of the x-ray beam, okay? Add a third apron, and now you're absorbing 99.7% of the x-ray beam. Add a fourth apron, which they don't show on here, and you're gonna be absorbing 99 point so on, more than 0.7, right? So you keep going, or you keep increasing the effectiveness of the, of the um, material as you increase the thickness of the material. Some of it's going to get through. That's the point though, okay? Some of it gets through the aprons. Other minimum lead thickness requirements. Um, in fluoroscopy, and, and yet even though you're a limited tech and you don't do fluoroscopy, your exam is, is created and the state exam you take, not the ones that you hit the school, the state board exam, it's created and administered by the ARRT, the American Registry of Radiologic Technologists. They make your exam, they set all the questions for it, and they very well could ask you questions related to fluoroscopy but not how to do fluoroscopy, questions with regard to what are like the safety requirements because you're an x-ray tech and we should know these things, okay? So you should expect these questions even though you're not gonna be doing fluoroscopic stuff. So don't be surprised if they have questions that have the word fluoroscopy in them even though we don't do it. But anyways, the fluoroscopy tower in an x-ray room, the thing that sits above the table for fluoroscopes uh, has shielding and it's required to have an equivalent shielding of two millimeters of lead. In a fluoroscopic x-ray room, which typically takes regular x-rays too, um, you may know that um, underneath the table, there's this tray. What's the tray's name? Bucky. Bucky. Okay, so Bucky, table Bucky, goes underneath the table, and this Bucky's job is to hold our cassette, right? That's for regular x-ray, okay? But this thing, so this thing sits underneath the table like that, and it slides up or down the table, okay? But now, you have a dual purpose table. It takes x-rays normally, but then you want to roll in the fluoroscopy stuff overhead, okay? The big fluoroscopy unit that sort of rolls into place. This thing would block the fluoroscope. Okay, because it's a big thing in the way. Okay, so this bucky has to slide to one end or the other of the table, and it stays at that end of the table during fluoroscopy. Okay, when this slides to one end of the table, this opening here underneath the table, well, underneath the table is an x ray tube. Okay, so our normal x ray tubes sit above the table. Okay, we hold on to them above the table, but a fluoroscopic x ray machine, the x ray tube is actually underneath the table. Okay, and when you're standing here as the x-ray tech, what part of your body is right at the level of this opening? Your gonads, right? So, and this has a big, if you've been to the side of any x-ray table, and you're welcome if you haven't to come up here and look at it, but there's a big opening here, okay? That big opening is so the bucky, this bucky tray can slide back and forth along the whole thing, okay? So I slide it to one end of the table to do fluoroscopy, and if this opening stayed open, that whole area would be shooting out x-rays towards the radiologists and radiographers gonads, okay? So, what do we have? Well, when this thing slides to one end to do fluoroscopy, this thing, a cover comes over that opening, a bucky slot cover, okay? That bucky slot cover has to be a quarter millimeter of a lead, uh, sorry, a quarter millimeter of lead thickness and covers the opening to protect the radiographers gonads. As well, in fluoroscopy, the big fluoroscopic machine up here, the image intensifier, but all the controls the uh, uh, radiologist would have above the table, the patient's on the table, that machine will come over the patient and have a shield, a, 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 a curtain that drops down in front of the patient. Okay, So between the patient and, and x-ray tech or radiologist, there's a curtain. Okay, for fluoroscopy, okay? We can come around to this side of the curtain and interact with our patient, but there's a curtain in front of us, okay? That curtain has to be a quarter millimeter of lead or lead equivalent, and they have to overlap, okay? So the curtain, you know, um, we have these kind of lines in here? Yeah, those kind of lines, those vertical lines, right? The fluoro curtain is like those vertical lines, right? They, they hang 
and they hang down, freely, freely hanging, and then they overlap each other. Okay, those blinds keep light from coming through, right? Our curtains keep X-rays from passing through. Those blinds are made of plastic. Ours are made of lead, quarter millimeter of lead. So those are some of our um, fluoro guidelines that are still important to know. Um, fluoroscopy machines. Um, by the way, here's a picture of a fluoroscopy machine. So let me briefly explain what you're looking at. So this table could do x-rays. So let me, let me show you some things. So this is a table for doing x-rays, much like this table is. Um, over here, right, this has been pushed off to the side in the room. This is your x-ray tube, your x-ray machine, okay? Our bucky that catches the images is underneath the table. So when we're doing regular x-rays, this whole thing is pushed back and out of the way, okay? During regular x-rays, this is pushed out of the way. This machine is brought overhead, okay? This is our regular x-ray thing to make regular plain film x-rays. We catch the images down below the table. However, during fluoroscopy, this thing, the x-ray tube, is pushed way out of the way in the room, okay? So it goes over into one corner of the room. Our fluoroscopic um, tower comes towards us, so if it's this table, it comes this way and over on top of the patient, okay? Um, the fluoroscopy tower uh, has the fluoro curtain here. So you see that curtain over the hanging uh, curtain. Um, a footboard to the table because often we do things like tilt the table completely vertical. This, this table, as well as this one, can go to a completely vertical position. So we can do things and tilt our patients around to see their fluids moving around, let's say. And during fluoroscopy, this tower comes over. The bucky goes to the foot of the table, and you'll get a cover coming over this, this whole opening here, okay? Um, but anyways, fluoroscopic x-ray table with diagnostic capabilities. This thing above the table in fluoroscopy is called an image intensifier. The whole apparatus is called the fluoro tower, okay? And for fluoroscopy, underneath the table is where the x-ray machine is housed, okay? Where in regular x-rays, there's our x-ray machine above the table. So this room is dual purpose. Um, Okay, let me move back, backtrack just a little bit, and then we'll come back to this picture in a moment. The fluoro tower must not be capable of operating with the tower in the park position. I don't know if you saw in the picture, and I'll go back to it in a minute, but that tower can be pushed, um, so if it's this table here, right, that tower can be pushed back so that I have the whole table open and I can bring my x-ray tube in position, or the tower can be brought over the table to actually do fluoroscopy. When the table is pushed back off of the table, it's called its park position. It's called be, being put in its park position. And it cannot be able to be operated when in park position because then it'd just be wasting and emitting radiation for no reason. Exposure cords on mobile radiography units are required to extend at least two meters from the x-ray machines. That's why when you're saying they were able to step out of the room, they are able to do that because their control button is on a cord and that allows them to get far away from the patient, <laughs> at least two meters from the patient. And we learned that at two meters from the patient, the beam energy, the scattered radiation is roughly you know, negligible at that point. Um, so yeah, two meters back from the x-ray machine, allowing the operator to stand back at a distance. Any person within two meters of the x-ray tube who cannot leave the area must be provided with a lead apron. And then for ALARA protection, ALARA is as low as reasonably achievable. Radiographers should always maximize both shielding and distance during exposure. Take everything that you can and, and you know, take advantage of everything you can, right? Try to minimize your timer on the source of radiation, maximize your distance from it, and maximize your shielding. Okay. So yeah, there's your, there's your fluoroscopic table. Okay, let's move on. By the way, is everyone okay with that? Okay, excellent. You have to practice those numbers. You just have to practice saying them to yourselves over and over again. There's just a lot of numbers and a lot of different things we have numbers for. You'll get it though. Okay, so I've covered this just you know briefly as I've been talking, but uh, uh, these are some policies for uh, holding patients or imaging plates or other, okay? So sometimes we have to shoot our x-rays, um, what are called cross table. Right? So normally the x-ray machine is above and shooting down through the table. 
Other times we have the x-ray machine pointed at the wall and a wall bucky, right? But sometimes the patient's gonna be laying down and we're gonna have to, you know, position our cassette with the patient laying down and the x-ray machine shooting across the table or cross table. Um, something has to hold the image receptor, okay? What I liked in the emergency rooms were the, the gurneys had, uh, you know, the sides came up, okay? You know, the rails and the gurneys. So when I had to shoot cross table, you can basically just pack a bunch of sheets between the, the, the gurney rails and the cassette to hold the sheet up. Basically, the patient's body part puts pressure on this side, sheets and stuff put pressure on the opposite side, and you just sort of improvise, right? Um, so your first choice for holding a cassette in the cross table position or holding a patient still for patient immobilization is a mechanical device. Something that can keep the patient, I'm looking around for something right now, something that can keep the patient still without having a person in the room or something that can keep the cassette still without having a person in the room. That's choice number one. Choice number two, adult relative or friend or guardian, somebody who is not working in that office. Choice number three, non-radiographic worker, Again, doctor, nurse, reception, someone like that. And choice four uh, uh, is the technologist or technician, but um, ideally a non-reproductive one. So if you're a lady between the ages of eight and 80, we don't want you to be in the x-ray room during the exposure because your gonads as a female have different sex cells in them than males' gonads. Males continually create, destroy, and produce which is part of create, but the, the sex cells, right? Where females, you probably have heard something to the effect of you're born with what you get, right? All of the eggs that you'll ever, ova that you'll ever produce, you're effectively born with, right? Okay. Um, by the way, of the 500 or so menstrual or, or ovarian cycles you'll have in your life, um, you are not born with only 500 ova, okay? You're born with 700,000 or more ova, so you don't get one per ovarian cycle. You have many, many, many of them. But anyways, they, they, they get damaged easy, more easily than males' sperm do. So we want to keep you out, so out of the room for that reason. If you say, no, I want to hold patients still, no one's going to stop you, okay? Which is just, it's just better for your for, uh, female reproductive health to stay out of the room. Good. So wear a shield if you have to. Double up your shields if you need to, right? If you're a pregnant radiographer, um, you should let the department know by declaring your pregnancy and um, it means to put it in writing you don't walk out and just declare it um, so put it in writing right and um, anybody seen, seen the office well there's an office episode where, where Michael Scott in the office uh, declares bankruptcy <laughs> he walks out in the middle of the hallway and goes I declare bankruptcy <laughs> so don't don't declare your pregnancy like that uh, put it put it in writing to, to your to your employ, to your employer uh, <laughs> But anyways, the point is, is that uh, we'll treat you a little bit differently if you declare pregnancy. We'll get you into their monitor. We'll keep you out of the radiation areas, things like that. Stuff to think about. Um, good. Minimize your exposure to radiation when possible. Distribute radiation exposure if it has to happen among the general population rather than amongst the technologists, right? Let everyone else get exposed because we're always around the exposure. And minimize the exposure to the reproductive population. Um, we want to minimize the amount of heritable defects that come out in our offspring as a population. And as a reproductive person, you will want to be around the uh, x-ray beam as little as possible. All right. A couple more policies and then we'll complete this section. I'll give you guys a short break after that. For fixed units, by the way, a fixed unit means the kind that are in our regular x-ray rooms. You can't roll it out of the x-ray room, okay? I only know of one facility that uses a mobile machine as a fixed unit. Um, almost all fixed units are quite literally fixed to the wall. You couldn't take them out of the room and roll them around. That's what we mean by fixed unit. For fixed units, the exposure cord must be too short to allow the operator out of the control booth. So if it has a, a cord and a, and, a, and a button, that cord and button cannot be so long that it lets you go all the way from your control booth into the x-ray room to make your exposure. That cord and button, which there shouldn't even be a cord, but that um, should be so short that it forces the radiographer to stay in the x-ray room to press the button because we have to press the button to make the exposure. And if it requires us to be in the room when the button's pressed, we cannot also be in the uh, x-ray suite. Now, um, some, like you'll be familiar with MedStop by now, right? 
our control booth is in a position where if you wanted to push the button and also stand around the corner, in principle you could, but why in the world would you do that, right? You've got a window to look through. The control booth must be constructed so that radiation can only reach the operator if it has scattered at least twice. Remember this, x-rays travel in straight lines, okay? So if, the x -ray, if an x-ray uh, photon, a particle of x-ray, gets to you, it can only do so if it's scattered twice, okay? Where does the first scatter event happen? The patient, right? The second scatter event will happen on somewhere in the, in the room, okay? It, after that second scatter event, it's fine. It's not going to hurt you. We say, roughly speaking, each scattering event reduces the energy of a photon by about one one thousandth. So two scattering events, one one thousand, so a thousand times less for the first event, and then a thousand times less at the second event. After an X-ray beam has scattered twice, it is about one one millionth of its original uh, energy. Okay, by constructing the control. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So it's not all the way against the wall, it's blocking the Yeah, so um, we've got our, our back wall here, our control booth here, right? Yeah. Radiographer standing behind the control booth, so the control booth is preventing x-rays from getting straight to him, right? But x-rays can go above and hit the ceiling and then scatter down towards him. That's fine, okay? This, after second scattering, will be about a one one millionth what the patient was exposed to. So significantly, so much less that it doesn't even matter at this point. Notice that the control booth does not extend all the way to the ceiling. Was that what you were asking? Yeah, Why does it go all the way to the ceiling? Yeah. Um, so our shielding, our for, we'll get into structural shielding in a little bit here, which that's a structural shielding question, but let me just give it to you now. Structural shielding, uh, lead shielding for our control booths need only extend to seven feet high. They do not have to go all, you know, this what, a 10 foot ceiling or whatever. If this, we were using this as an x-ray room, we would only have to have shielding up to seven feet. So that last three feet or whatever does not have to be shielded. And that's because we're allowing for scattered above that because it would have to have scattered off of something. It can't take, you know, a, 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 you know, a parabolic path. It has to go in straight lines, meaning it would have to have scattered twice. So yeah, seven feet high for our control booths okay, rather than them going all the way to the ceiling. Your employer, or whoever built the building, is welcome to have put it all the way to the ceiling, but lead's expensive, and you're probably only gonna do the required amount, right, when the required amount is seven feet. So there you go. How thick are those, those um, like the walls? Yeah, so I mean, this is like, that's a really good question we'll, we'll do in our, in our next set of notes in a few minutes here, but there's two types of barriers, primary and secondary. Your control booth is a secondary barrier, and they're a half the lead thickness requirement of primary barriers. Primary barriers are required to be 1 16th of an inch of lead. So 1 16th of an inch, secondary barrier, 1 32nd of an inch. Uh, so that's how thick the lead is. Next time you are in and around our x-ray room, and feel free to do this today if you want, but go in and look at the wood paneling of the inside of our x-ray room and uh, look at the corn, the edge of the wall, and you'll notice, you'll be able to see behind the wood paneling is a sheet of dark material, that's the lead in the wall. And you can actually see how thick it is. <laughs> No, no, no. So, like, uh, think about it like this, right? The beam starts here, okay? It comes down towards the patient, right? This is called pri ah. this is called primary radiation, right? Primary beam or primary radiation. It hits the patient and then does something, scatters, right? Goes up this way. That's the first scatter event. So one X-ray photon strikes the patient, scatters off in that direction, okay? It hits the ceiling here, interacts with the ceiling, causing it to scatter another time. This is scatter number one at the patient, scatter number two up at the ceiling. The x-ray beam has interacted with something twice before it's gotten to, to you know, this one happened to have missed the patient, the radiographer, but it'll have scattered twice before it strikes the radiographer. That's the idea. And the control booths are always built in that way. That's why they are set up in the spots that they are in your rooms. That's why they often don't extend all the way to the ceiling. Um, yeah, that's the reason for all of that. Last couple notes and then we'll take a break. Uh, 
recommended policies for uh, pregnancy. You should encourage, but not require, the reporting of pregnancy at the earliest possible time. This is, this is for workers. Uh, once it's reported and declared, a second monitor worn at the waist level under, under any lead apron. Notice uh, our normal monitors worn outside of the aprons. The, pregnant, uh, the fetal monitors worn under the apron. This more, more, sorry, this more directly indicates the fetal dose. Wearing it under the apron tells you what's more likely what's actually getting down to the fetus. Limit that pregnant radiographer from high dose procedures. Just recommend that they you know, avoid surgery and fluoroscopy and things like that. And document instructions for the uh, dose equivalent limits, their actual dose limits and good ALARA guidelines. Again, if, you, if ALARA is a new term for you, it means as low as reasonably achievable. And it's just sort of a philosophy about doing x-rays. Use the least amount that you can. Involuntary leave is not necessary. You, you can't, uh, employers can't just kick her out of the x-ray room. She can declare pregnancy and still keep doing her job, okay? Okay, that's actually it for this, uh, this set of notes. Go ahead and, um, Pause here.